Shepard, and just uh, I, I think uh, some of you know already him, but uh, Silas is uh, at the moment working with the government of uh, Liberia uh, and civil society organizations and is uh, coordinating efforts to bring uh, more than one million hectares of land under the control of local communities and uh, uh, towards their ownership rights. Um, Silas has championed for um, around uh, 20 years uh, community forest and land rights in Liberia. And for this incredible work, I must admit, he has received uh, international awards, uh, among others, the Whitley Award for Environment and Human Rights in 2002, uh, the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2006. And he was also among the Time Magazine's Heroes of Environment in 2008. Um, in Liberia, Silas funded a Sustainable Development Institute, and uh, he's also uh, he also starred in a film, in an award-winning uh, documentary film uh, that was uh, screened at the International Documentary Festival. If you haven't watched it, I strongly recommend to do so. Uh, currently, and since 2015, uh, Silas uh, is working for the Sustainable Trade Initiative, uh, IDH, and is uh, leading on the land governance, coordinating participatory land use planning and customary land rights uh, formalization in Liberia. Uh, today, uh, Silas is going to present uh, um, what needs to be done uh, to keep up the momentum, political momentum in a country like Liberia from different actors like civil society, uh, but also private sector. So he's guiding through uh, the actual implementation of uh, policy commitments with the participation of uh, specific actors. Uh, so Silas, the floor is yours. That wonderful uh, introduction. So again, my name is Silas. Siako and I'm the country manager at IDA, the Sustainable Trade Initiative in Liberia. And I've worked on natural resource uh, governance for the past uh, 20 years with a primary focus on land and forestry issues. I am deeply honored to speak at this year's conference to share some reflections based on the Liberian experience and to send a clarion call to colleagues within civil society academia and the private sector to step up and do more to strengthen land governance. The future of our planet depends on it. This year's conference under the theme Land Crisis and Resilience focuses on the challenges that global intertwining crisis pose to land governance systems, processes, and actors. It seems to me that this year we are coming together with messages of hope, with stories of resilience from different parts of the world, but also with messages of despair when we highlight the crisis and challenges millions face in different parts of the world because they are denied land rights or their governments are not doing enough to protect their land rights. It also seems to me the land rights of local communities, indigenous peoples, and landless people around the world will feature prominently in the dialogues at this year's conference. The focus on land crisis and resilience is very timely, I believe, because urgent and collective actions are needed if we are to leave a healthy planet behind for our children and our grandchildren. Formalizing and legally protecting land rights of local communities, indigenous peoples, and disadvantaged groups is crucial and will define whether humanity fails to succeed in tackling the multiple and intertwined crises we face today. As Charles Strait writes in the ecosystem marketplace a while ago, respecting local land and forest rights, strengthening local institutions, and cooperating with community-based organizations and trusted non-governmental organizations with a local presence are critical sources factors for efforts to reduce deforestation. The World Resource Institute also argues that secure land, protected land rights of indigenous people and local communities lead to healthier forests and reduce deforestation. The evidence is compelling that urgent action is needed is not in dispute. 
Today, as we celebrate our successes and share our messages of hope, I also want to speak about the opportunities that we are letting up, the windows of opportunities that may be closing, and specifically challenge civil society, academia, the private sector to step up where governments are letting up or giving way for land tenure reforms. Time is not on our side. As an activist and advocate promoting land rights for local communities, I feel that civil society, academia, and private sector could do more to keep the promise. The promise that secure land rights of local communities and indigenous people can lead to share prosperity, better land and natural resource governance, and a healthier climate. To better illustrate the opportunities before us, I will use the developments in Liberia to anchor those examples. Liberia, as a bit of a background, situated in West Africa and bordering Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Ivory Coast, was founded in 1822 by free slaves that have returned to Africa from the Americas. The country has vast tropical rainforests and significant deposits of gold, iron ore, and other minerals. Despite its vast natural resource wealth, Liberia ranks 175th of 189 countries listed in the UNDP Human Development Index in 2019. Life expectancy stands at 64.1 years in 2019. Weak governance characterized by rampant corruption, exclusion of the vast majority of the population from political and economic life of the country, and economic collapse in the 1980s contributed to a civil war breaking out in 1990. The policy and legal framework that we now have, governing land and forests, are extremely progressive, and that will be a part, a big focus of our comments today. Civil society and their international allies now have an opportunity to work with the government, private sector, and other stakeholders to support local communities to turn their bundle of rights that are now provided under the land rights policy and the land rights law into meaningful and positive changes in their overall well-being through sustainable lifestyles, shared and inclusive economic prosperity and good governance. We will mark the third anniversary of the law that came into effect in October, in this coming October. In the last three years, we have seen some progress in implementation by local civil society organizations with support from IDH and other development partners. More than 1 million hectares, or just over 11% of the entire country, is now under collective community ownership and control. This is progress compared to a decade ago when the notion of community ownership and control of their customary land was considered far-fetched by the elites and powerful politicians that did everything they could to derail progress towards the enactment of the land rights law. The government, to its credit, has made important strides in developing the regulations that are needed to fully implement the law. And it's encouraging civil society to lead on efforts to support communities to formalize their land rights. In a world where civic space is shrinking and external actors continue to wreak havoc on indigenous people and local communities, these are important developments in Liberia. While we celebrate these milestones, Let's not, however, lose sight of the challenges that lie ahead. 
First, weak governance at the local level presents a threat to our peace and security, which remains fragile. Land-related disputes are widespread and some easily escalate into violence that leaves in its wake destruction of lives and properties. While we applaud civil society organizations for their efforts supporting these communities, we must also challenge them to improve the quality of their services on the ground. Additionally, addressing weak land governance at the community level requires civil society taking steps to strengthen their technical capacities, embedding competent multidisciplinary teams in the communities they serve, and being more accountable for the resources they receive. Secondly, hundreds of thousands of Liberians, including myself, even though I was born and raised in rural Liberia, are landless in our own country. A phenomenon that is neither recognized nor understood. While we often hear about women lacking land rights, what we don't ever hear is that when women are denied land rights, their male children also face the same problem or sometimes even worse. In my case, because my father chose to settle with my mother in her hometown, he lost his right to a share in my paternal grandfather's land. And even though my mother is the first of five children, she did not inherit portion of my maternal grandfather's land because she is a female. Consequently, we, the male children, and our sisters have no land in our father's village, and neither do we have land in our mother's village. And I imagine that this phenomenon is common in many patriarchal societies around the world. Researching and understanding this phenomenon could contribute to further development and improvements in policies and laws governing customary collective land rights. Third, three years on, civil society is yet to demonstrate it has a strategy for working with communities to realize the promise that secure land rights would translate into improvements in their well-being. Without a strategy which emphasizes good governance at the local level and facilitating mutually beneficial business relationships with the private sector, there is a real risk that private sector there is a real risk that hopes we have raised and aspirations we have inspired across the country will not be realized. In the last three years, I have spent many sleepless nights wondering about the question after formalization, what next? Because there is so much focus on customary land formalization, but what happens afterwards is often not significantly discussed. What then will land owning communities do once they have a formal title deed, for example? Would they now be economically rewarded for their efforts and contributions to reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation? Does this lay the foundation for farmer cooperatives to now invest in sustainable production because they know the market will reward them for doing so? Could agriculture or timber companies, for example, instead of preying on communities, now work in joint ventures with communities based on sustainable forestry and land use principles? And will communities now make inclusive and informed decisions on such partnerships, or will business as usual continue? These are fundamental questions we need to start to ask now because we have an opportunity to make that shift, to move away from business as usual into a new environment in which communities and private sector can work together on mutually beneficial enterprise development. 
a robust civil society strategy that explores these and related questions, a strategy that is forward taking on supporting communities' capacities for sustainable development, combined with sustainable governance of natural resources, a strategy that aims to enable land use to produce more in a sustainable manner, protect our land, water, and forest resources, and deliver benefits for all is the only pathway to keeping the promises that we've made. Private sector or companies for their part must step up and demonstrate that they are prepared to carry out major reforms of their business models and practices, including working with local communities to build mutually beneficial business relationships for shared prosperity in this new environment. At IDH, we are learning that building these type of relationships take time and significant efforts to build the trust that we need to have with communities. And that's because they have been lied to so many times and abused for decades. Now businesses and business models and means of engaging with land owning communities need to be proven by companies that commit to developing mutually beneficial and meaningful partnerships with communities. This can start with companies, for example, reforming their policies to comply with internationally accepted standards, such as, for example, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and taking very concrete actions to implement those policies. As times have changed, social conditions have changed, and the political economy of the land sector has dramatically changed. It is high time that academia do more to take advantage of the research opportunities or questions that exist in different countries to add to our body of knowledge. In Liberia, for example, there are so many questions that need urgent answers. If we are to deliver on the promise of shared prosperity and good governance of land and forest. In closing, let's be reminded that recognizing, formalizing, and legally protecting customary land rights laid the foundation for resilience but on its own, it is not enough. Civil society, private sector, and academia should do more to work with local communities and indigenous people where their rights are established to march forward towards a just, inclusive, and sustainable future. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a successful conference I hope we can leave here with new commitments to do our part and contribute to good governance of land and natural resources around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silas. It was very interesting and inspiring. And uh, I think that it's very good that you reminded us that uh, land is not end but is a means to something that is much much more important which is livelihood and uh, uh human rights good security and all these other things so i think that uh, it's important we all always remind ourselves that and uh thanks for sharing the experience uh, of liberia uh i don't see any questions in the chat uh so please feel free to put any uh, question that you might have or any comment uh, there might be the possibility also to give space uh, uh, for you because we have plenty of time here. Uh, but let me start maybe uh, with a question for you, Silas. So I just uh, set the tone a little bit. Um, of course, you, are, you talk about formalization of rights, which is important and it is a starting point. Uh, but there are different interpretations of how to conduct formalization of rights. Uh, so, what would be your opinion, your ideas on uh, the best ways, uh, the process to follow uh, for the formalization of rights, of customary rights, of women's rights, etc.? 
in our situation in Liberia, what the law provides for are some very basic steps towards formalization. First, supporting the communities to self-identify, come together on their own accord to present themselves to the government and to other stakeholders that this is the unit that they would like to define themselves by. The law also provides that in supporting them, civil society and other stakeholders are to work based on the principles of good governance, really supporting them to build institutions that are inclusive, that are accountable, that are transparent and very uh, participatory. What I'm uh, uh, pitching uh, these days to a lot of people is that the only way that we can achieve that, that's a very tall order. The only way we can achieve in that realm is to make sure that the civil society actors that are supporting these communities are by themselves accountable and very transparent. And they are investing in their own capacity development to ensure that the quality of the services they provide are up to the tax. Because if we don't do that, there is a risk that we support communities to go through the loops, but at the end of the day, they will like the, the type of governance institutions that are needed to ensure that women and other vulnerable people, uh, other marginalized groups, rights are protected. Because we have a very uh, uh, delicate situation in which, on the one hand, we would like to promote and respect traditional knowledge, traditional values, traditional uh, uh, practices, but at the same time, we are very aware that some of those practices are not particularly positive for today's uh, uh, time. Therefore, women-led rights is at the center of much of the uh, advocacy that's ongoing because we now have the collective rights being provided for. So there is quite some focus now on making sure that women land rights are adequately protected as these communities develop their governance instruments and their governance and their institutions. Thanks a lot, Silas. So I think accountability and transparency is very key in one of the sectors where corruption and bad governance is at a very high level. So thanks for reminding us and also the importance of uh, protecting vulnerable groups and people's rights. Um, I'm reading real time a comment so, uh, by Ayan. Uh, in your experience, are local communities empowered enough to demand the land rights they are entitled to? And if not, how can they be supported and empowered to do so? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Uh, in your experience, are local communities empowered enough to demand the land rights they are entitled to? And if not, how can they be supported, empowered to do so? I think in the case of Liberia, and that's precisely the reason why I took this opportunity to challenge civil society to do better and supporting communities to formalize. Because we now have a law that protects communities' land rights. It is now time that we provided them the support they need to formalize. It is an open space. They have all the support, the legal uh, protection that they need in order to do that. The law is on their side. However, in order for them to take those rights to the next level, to be able to benefit from the full bundle of rights that is now being bestowed on them, I think it is important that civil society organizations invest quite a bit in just making sure that A, communities understand the full extent of the rights they now have, and that B, they are cohesive enough to stand as a unified uh, group to be able to defend those rights if they do come under attack. Uh, communities in Liberia have proven, uh, and I'm a living witness to that, that they have the capacity, they just need a little bit more support and uh, encouragement from other stakeholders to be able to stand up for those rights. I've seen that in the field, 
I know that uh, that uh, uh, commitment on their part is there. They just need a little bit more boost for civil society and some capacity development to be able to govern their land uh, areas better. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I see other questions coming in. Uh, so you mentioned about the importance of inclusive governance institutions. So the question here is, in your thoughts, uh, what are the better ways to ensure this uh, inclusive governance institution happen? And uh, which actors are supposed to participate? Um, then there is another question. Uh, you also mentioned about so the importance of uh, what next after land formalization. So what are your thought, thoughts? more in detail about what should happen next after the land formalization. Thank you. Uh, I will start with the one next uh, question. For me, uh, a decade in the trenches, working with different actors, really putting pressure on the government to change our land policy, to change our law, to provide for this type of rights, all along, I always felt, and I always asked myself the question, what then after those rights are recognized and protected? And the reason why this question is extremely important is because these communities that live especially in forested parts of the country, they will now have control over the forest resources that we have in abundance. If they are able, if they are going to be excited about protecting that forest, about managing it better, about developing their communities along more sustainable uh, pathways, they need to be assured and reassured that when they do that, their overall well-being will be secure and will be supported and that things will improve in their communities. It is extremely difficult for anyone, in my experience, in the communities that I work, to embrace conservation, to embrace sustainable management, unless you can demonstrate that there is something in it for them today and for the next generation to come. Therefore, it is extremely important that we begin to think about very uh, innovative ways in which we can support the NGOs, we can support the communities, we can support private sector to work with them in building the type of relationship they need to have uh, mutually uh, uh, beneficial enterprises being developed in these areas going forward. In the absence of that, if business as usual should continue, I do not believe that we will be able to sustain the momentum that we see today. So private sector has to take a long, hard look at itself, see how it has done business in the past, and come to the conclusion, as I have, that business as usual will not thrive in this new environment. It will only create more chaos, more conflict, more uh, challenges in their effort to work with communities. It will no longer be able to thrive as it did in the past. Therefore, that has to change. But that can only happen if communities have the capacity, have the governance capacity for that matter, to be able to make decisions that are uh, broad-based, that are accepted by the different segments of their community, that uh, takes into account the rights and interests of all the different uh, segments of their communities. If they don't have that capacity, we will only be transferring uh, corruption and bad governance from the national level to the local level. That's why local civil society, and by the way, their international partners, those that work with us to demand yesterday for tenure reform, I believe they have now an obligation to work with us to strengthen Liberian civil society to be able to deliver on these uh, obligations that I believe they now have to these communities. Thanks, Silas. Now we have, I think, uh, three set of questions. Uh, one is about uh, the risk of manipulation and corruption by vested interest. So how it can be done in a way that these type of interests are not 
governing the process of formalization of rights. The other one is about the affordability of the formalization process, so like cost for getting the titles. And uh, then there is another one about the uh, women's land rights uh, acquisition. It is and the request about uh, uh, giving an idea of what is happening in Liberia. Are women uh, only acquiring through inheritance or traditional ways or also through different means like buying land? So these three set of questions. I will start from the last one in terms of women and land rights. And I would again just remind us that sometimes we narrow the scope of the problem when we uh, uh, elevate or we focus too much, very narrowly on women land rights. Uh, because there are very large segments of the population in these communities, men and women, who are uh, in the same boat, are being deprived, their rights are not being respected and protected. Therefore, I like to speak to all of them. And what I think needs to happen again is that we who support civil society organizations, the development partners that provide resources to civil society, all of us that are engaging with these communities need to first realize that they are challenged because they do not have the governance capacity uh, to be able to effectively govern their land and forest resources. And this has happened because over time, local governance, customary governance regimes have been manipulated uh, and eroded by political elites that have used uh, local governance institutions for their own benefits. That is part of the reality within which we are going to be working or which we are working at the moment. Therefore, what needs to happen is that even within civil society, we have to demonstrate. We have to go out there and make it sure that people understand and again can go back to their traditional practices. Those elements of good governance that are in their traditional practices can be reawakened. This is not a particular new concept, in, at least in my tradition. We have elements of good governance practices embedded right through our own uh, norms and practices. However, those are being eroded over time. So we need to go back and work with those communities to strengthen those and to bring them up in such a way that women, young men that are born to those women who rights are being uh, denied and not respected, that they all can come back into the fold of the community and be able to benefit. Another phenomenon that's extremely important to bear in mind is that while these changes are intended to benefit the marginalized, including the women, because they've had to live with this type of marginalization for decades, they themselves, in some instances, feel very much uh, uneasy uh, uh, uneasy about challenging the status quo. In some communities, they will say to you, you know what, let's let sleeping dogs lie. Let's continue to work within the current regime and see how we can improve the situation. Therefore, quite a bit of sensitivity needs to be applied as well as we work with these communities because they have been abused for so long, the uh, marginalized segments of the population have been deprived for so long, they've internalized all of these injustices and have come to a point where they think that they can live with it, which is not the case. It's just a matter of time. In terms of cost, this is where, again, my plea for civil society to move towards embedding people in the field. Communities will not trust you unless they know you very well. They will trust you if you live with them, you experience their reality on a day-to-day -day basis, and you interact with them throughout. That will not, uh, uh, the trust will not be there if you fly in today and fly out tomorrow. You parachute in, you do a workshop today, you do a, a two-day training, and then you fly out. They don't see you 
for another two to three months before you show up again. That's not going to cut it. So we need to find uh, development practitioners, civil society actors that are ready to make the sacrifice because that's what's needed. To live in these communities, to work with the people hand in hand, being with them, experiencing the challenges they have to deal with in order to be able to understand and better support them. Um, finally, I think uh, how we uh, can kind of bring all of this together, I tend to believe, maybe naively so, that if we can demonstrate by our own examples that we can show to them as organizations, civil society organizations, that transparency does deliver benefits, that participation does deliver benefits, that accountability does deliver benefits. If we can demonstrate to them that indeed there are benefits to be gained, they will believe you. Many times, people ask me in the villages, do you really believe that the principles of good governance are realistic? Can any society ever function based on these principles? And I say to them, yes, it is possible, but it does require effort. That message will be stronger and much more convincing if we within civil society lead by those examples. Thanks a lot, Silas. And uh, there is a very specific question uh, from Hus. Uh, if you have any advice to give, uh, for instance, to young graduate or young researcher that are interested in uh, exploring the land rights issues, for instance, in Liberia, but they can't travel at the moment. So do you have any advice on how to advance research for people that cannot do research in the field? It's unfortunate that I think the pandemic has created the type of uh, challenges we are facing globally. But like every other challenge, I believe this too will pass. Uh, however, in the very uh, short term, in the short and medium term, I do believe a very uh, strategic first step will be to start building relationships with civil society actors on the ground. Building those relationships in ways that allow for knowledge exchange, for information exchange, in ways that everybody go, everyone walks away feeling that they benefited from that relationship. For example, if a young researcher in the Netherlands was interested in working on the particular question that may may be applicable to the situation in Liberia. I would say identify a Liberian organization that is interested in research and working with them to develop the questions, to develop the guidance so that they can also support a data collection and work with you on analysis, bringing the local uh, experience and local knowledge into that uh, uh, research uh, relationship. I have seen this. I have worked with others remotely uh, since uh, 2020, and I do see there is a lot of benefit, but it does require careful balance between uh, finding ways to work with people on the ground and basically trying to extract information for your own purposes. Unless those on the ground can see benefits to engaging with young researchers, they are unlikely to be able to be supportive. But if you can develop these relationships in a way that can demonstrate to Liberian civil society and civil society actors in other parts of the, the world that are interested in doing more research on their situation, if you can demonstrate that they also stand to benefit from the knowledge, then I'm quite uh, confident that those relationships can be strengthened and built. Thanks for this message to academia. And now we have one, uh, I think probably the last one on uh, uh, private sector. So the question is, uh, uh, how can the private sector, according to your experience, best support the call to uphold community land rights? So I will use a very practical example. I am at the moment, as part of my day job, working with a private sector organization to develop a model, a business model 
that they can work with the communities to implement as a joint venture, for example. This is new for Liberia. Because the space we now have has only recently been created. However, what that means is that the private sector organization is listening to us to define the parameters of that relationship that they will be building with these communities. We are working together to define the process of engagement and what is considered ethical engagement with these communities and in ways that are empowering, not necessarily, uh, not primarily to kind of uh, uh, just share information or to dictate to communities how the business relationship will be, but actually say, these are our ideas. What do you think about it? What are your own ideas? How do you think a collaboration should look like? What type of partnership should we be developing? What type of benefits will you be expected to see from this relationship? Those are questions that we need to be very honest about, very sincere about, and I do believe that it is indeed possible for private sector to make that leap, to give themselves that uh, space to explore these new possibilities. So I'm very confident that uh, the private sector organization we are working with we are going to build a model that we will test together. There will be mistakes. We will learn from those mistakes and we uh, address the weaknesses in the model and actually implement. And hopefully, if we can succeed with that, we can be able to showcase that uh, to others around the world. But I think the first thing is there has to be commitment to trying something different. And that is what I think is extremely important for the private sector the willingness to try something different and not uh, hanging onto the old business as usual model and insisting that that's the only way they know. Thanks, Silas. A very nice message to you also for the private sector. This very last one, we have one minute, and is from international organizations, uh, uh, recognizing the importance of building trust with local communities, but also the challenge to have time from international organizations to spend time with local communities. So the question is, would it be an option to work with trusted intermediaries moderating between local communities and civil organizations? I think the, the opportunities are there. Uh, however, again, maybe uh, focusing very narrowly on Liberia, but I do believe that many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have these challenges as well. Uh, a lot of young professionals in Liberia have not had the opportunity uh, to really uh, practice uh, to spend time in the field, to really learn uh, through working uh, on the ground. We had almost 14, 15 years of civil war that had very significant impact uh, on people's capacity to develop. That's why I think international organizations, especially within the civil society space, where there is strong capacity, and I can speak to this because at the Sustainable Development Institute, when I served there, we invested a lot in building relationships with young professionals from Europe and America. In every given year, we will have, for example, five fellows working with us on the ground. And through that arrangement, we will pair young Liberians with the internationals to work on the ground and through that, share knowledge, share experience, and share uh, their know-how on the ground to their work together. I think these are very uh, low-cost ways in which knowledge transfer can, could take place. These are very low-cost ways in which the international organizations with decades of experience on these issues could be able to share their knowledge with Liberian civil society organizations and individuals that are working with these communities. I, I, uh, I'm not a particularly uh, a big fan of um, maybe uh, a situation in which 
uh, uh, there is a lot of responsibility that transfer to the international partners, particularly in terms of resource mobilization. I do believe working together, transferring skills, transferring knowledge, working hand in hand, and really creating opportunity for locals to learn from international and for internationals to also learn from locals so that there is that mutually beneficial relationship. I think that will go a long way in helping us to make the most of the window of opportunity that we have now. Thanks, Silas. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I think we have been granted two minutes more. So that's also very special. And uh, so I thank everybody for the participation. And thanks, Silas. Uh, there is a break of 15 minutes now. And I hope to see you in the parallel session. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Silas.